Hello, I'm Chris Edson, Education Specialist here with uh, Brookside Laboratories, uh, part of the Amplify Network. Uh, if you'd indulge me for a minute, I'm going to try to quickly run through the nitrogen cycle. And I know this is something that we've all seen in a lot of different forms, um, so I don't want to get too deep into this. But I, I did think there was some value in kind of um, slowing this down um, and just sort of walking through each part of this or each component of this cycle. It is the most complex cycle. Um, of all of the, the, the nutrients that, that, that we do manage, uh, which is why this one is, is uh, so difficult to, to sort of wrap our heads around and to manage. It's, it's sort of the holy grails. If we get nitrogen figured out, we can uh, uh, hit a real home run. So it's worth kind of looking at the different components and thinking about it. So, okay, so the, the, the first thing to think about is the largest pool of nitrogen that is out there is in the atmosphere of the air above us. So 78% of the atmospheric gas on earth is nitrogen gas. Um, but it's in this N2 form here. So this, this nitrogen, dinitrogen gas, it's triple bonded, it's inert, it's highly inactive, it doesn't react with other stuff, which is why it's so abundant in the atmosphere is because it's not really reactive with other things. Um, so if you're looking at a, a 40 acre field and you do the math, 78% uh, above that is you're looking at there's 2.8 billion pounds of nitrogen um, just floating in, in the air right above uh, uh, your uh, your 40 acre field. Now, that is sort of a cruel joke because it's completely unavailable, unavailable to this corn plant. So you got 40 acres of corn, 2.8 billion pounds of nitrogen floating around it, and water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink because that corn can't use any of it. Um, so now, so corn is taking in um, nitrogen is the fourth most abundant um, nutrient in plant tissue in the grain tissue. Uh, so you got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen combined are over 90% of the weight of the plant, uh, but somewhere between you know three and six percent, depending on the plant, uh, of the rest of the biomass is nitrogen. So it is very abundant. There's it's everywhere, um, but it's uh, it does not get any of that up from the atmosphere. So where does it come from? Uh, well, it's got to take it up through its root system. It's got to come in um, plant uptake through the roots, uh, So, which is which is fine. So we're, we're introducing a cycle here. So we do know that it's cycling. That's what we're talking about. So nitrogen is coming up from the soil through the root system into the plant. And then at the end of the year, as the plant dies, those residues are going back down to the soil. And for the most part, a lot of it is, is, is going back into this soil organic matter or the organic nitrogen pool, which is the second most abundant pool. So if you're, we're talking on that 40 acre field above the ground, you've got 1.2 billion pounds, or I'm sorry, 2.8 billion pounds uh, of uh, nitrogen. And at the same time, um, let's say, just do the math on this. So um, on a, say you've got a 4% organic matter field, 4% organic matter, um, you've got since, since about 5% of organic matter is the organic nitrogen, uh, you do the math, you're looking at another 160,000 pounds of nitrogen uh, in a 40 acre field. So it's just surrounded, this plant is just surrounded by lots and lots of nitrogen. But as you can see here, we're calling the cycling. Uh, there's, no, there's no dot connecting this organic pool um, back into the roots. So the, the plant's not uptaking from this organic end pool. And um, just real quickly, so most of this pool, I, I've got below ground inputs, roots, and above ground inputs from the leaves, uh, the vast majority of that, this is gonna come from the roots. Um, so the organic matter um, is more root than it is above ground biomass. And that's just the di digestive process versus the oxidation, mineralization of the residues on the surface. But so, so most of this is gonna be coming from the roots, uh, but it's not plant available. Um, so, we're talking about cycling and we wish this was a closed system and all of the nitrogen the plant was taking would stay in the soil, but it's not. You know, we're harvesting. So there is nitrogen leaving the system um, right here in the grain, which is which is really where we're, we're making our money. So um, that's that's an acceptable loss and we want a big harvest. So we want a lot leaving here. We just got to manage um, this other stuff. So um, previous to World War II, before we had the Haber-Bosch process that could make um, inorganic fertilizers, which is really interesting if you'd like to read into that sometime, I, I encourage it. There's a lot of cool stories about how that all happened and um, it, it's pretty interesting. But so before um, we had um, inorganic fertilizers, everything was manure inputs. I mean, our nitrogen was either green manures from cover crops or, or legumes and things like that, or actual livestock manure inputs. And as we know, most of that 
nitrogen in manure is in the organic pool. So this is mainly contributing here to this organic pool, but we can see here we're still a disconnect between plant uptake and, and the second largest pool um, in, in the uh, atmosphere in the land. So what it, what forms is the corn plant or any other plant actually taking up? So it's these, these two main forms, these are our plant available in organic forms. So nitrate, NO3 minus, anion, negatively charged, and then uh, the ammonium ion, um, cation, positively charged. So these two are, are what can go into this plant uptake pool and, and go into the root system. So our cycle here um, is, is, is as it is right there. Uh, so where do these two forms come from? How do we get those? Well, today, um, for the most part, like I mentioned, we're supplying that. We're, we're supplying those directly with our inorganic nitrogen fertilizer inputs. Now, ultimately, like I alluded to earlier, these products are being made with this source. Um, so uh, we're just we're just using uh, natural gas to split this bond and then create these products that, that we're just applying that are directly into the plant available form. Now, in a perfect world, um, all of these that we added would only have one fate and the plant would take them up. But that's just not the way it is. So, um, so we and, and we also know that previous to us being able to make inorganic fertilizers, we were somehow getting nitrogen into plants, and we know that the organic pool is not directly con contributing to it. So there must be some type of transformation processes. So now moving on, the, these dotted line boxes will will represent transformations of nitrogen in the soil. Uh, so the first one that we'll talk about, um, kind of the most uh, I, I think it's the most interesting, but so mineralization. So all mineralization means any any time you're using that term, all it means is we're we're converting something from an organic form to an inorganic form. So we're mineralizing it, and and this process is actually a two-step process. I'm not going to go into details, but the first step is called aminization, and then the second step is ammonification. So so an amine group, amines are happening here. So in the first step, um, there are some uh, in, in high pH soil conditions, this is this process is sort of mediated or mostly dictated by uh, bacteria. In acidic conditions or, or lower, um, this is going to be driven by fung fungal uh, fungal activity. Um, neutral pHs is going to be kind of both are happening. But this first step is we're taking proteins from the organic nitrogen and we're breaking it into basically three different carbon and nitrogen containing compounds that are smaller. So there's very specialized fungus and bacteria that can degrade a protein and break it into amines, urea, and amino acids. So those are all three smaller compounds that then can be worked on in the second step by a lot more uh, diverse communities. So it's very specialized bacteria on the first step that breaks proteins into the sort of the three groups. And then once the three meals are sort of laid out, a whole suite of bacteria and fungi kind of go, go nuts on the rest of it and, and do that conversion. And they get their carbon from the urea and from the uh, um, uh, amine groups and the um, amino acids, and then the end product being this, this ammonium. So two-step process, very specialized and then very kind of abundant. Now, once ammonium is converted or once it's made into ammonium, um, this this doesn't stay in this process. You know, obviously that would be fantastic if all of this was just plant uptake right there, um, but that's that's not the way it works. So generally, um, this wants to stay in this form for a week to two weeks. Now, uh, there's once it goes into the ammonium form, um, if it's not plant uptake, there's a couple fates that can happen, and and one of the most common ones is is immobilization. Now, and what this means is this ammonium, instead of going up the plant uptake pathway and helping contribute to building biomass for a plant, immobilization means that it's being used in the same way, but it's not going into plant, it's going back into this pool. So what I mean is there are microbes need nitrogen, bacteria need nitrogen, fungi need nitrogen, you know, actinomycetes and, and, and protozoa and all of these guys, they need nitrogen too, just like every, all plants, all animal, all life needs nitrogen. So it'll be, there's competition between plant roots and bacteria and bacteria usually win this contest. 
I mean, bacteria and, and plant life or microbial life is usually better at getting the ammonium than, than plants. It's almost like plants get what's left over after the bacteria have gotten what they need to kind of keep their pool going. So there's this constant battle of, of microbes consuming each other and degrading each other and repopulating. And, and this is very commonly quickly happening all over the place. And um, this, is, this is dictated by soil pH and temperature and, and all of these things. Now, whether or not um, it's going to be more of this going on versus more of this going on is why we talk about our carbon to nitrogen ratios. So if you're putting inputs of high carbon uh, uh, grasses and things like that into here, um, you're going you're gonna to be um, depleting the system of nitrogen uh, because they need a lot of nitrogen to help degrade that stuff and break that down. So this is going to be... Um, more, uh, I guess, more pronounced than the mineralization it would be net immobilization. You have more of it going this way than this way. Now, when you're starting incorporating legumes and uh, you're coming out of a, an alfalfa rotation or something like that, um, there's there's a lot more lower carbon to nitrogen rate residues going into here. So you're going to have more of this going on, and they don't need to immobilize quite as much. So that's where we're starting to hopefully see more on the plant uptake side of things. So that's why when we're talking soil health and diverse crop rotations and everything like that, we're trying to, to mix up the residues and, and kind of get lower carbon nitrogen ratio materials out there so that this process is, you know, a little bit more than this one. Um, now I, I've already kind of talked about legumes and stuff like that. So not the, the only, not the only way of getting from, uh, nitrogen um, from this process, you know, previously, before we had these inorganic inputs and we could do this in the Haber-Bosch process, uh, we relied a lot more on this. So biological fixation, there are certain bacteria and things like that that can, that can fix nitrogen. When, when we say fix nitrogen, we're, we're breaking an N2 bond and putting it into a form that a plant can use. So uh, there's bacteria that make uh, uh, symbiotic relationships you got the nodules on, on the roots and things like that and what they're doing is they're trading the plants giving them carbon to survive and in exchange they're they're doing the work to break this bond and, and make a plant available nitrogen for the plant to use so um, that's that's kind of where that's going on there um, now um, one thing that doesn't often get talked about because it's so small and I'm not going to spend much time on it is is with this being a cation it is exchangeable so when we talk about our cation exchange or our TEC um, on our Brookside report you've got that other traces well a little bit of ammonium could be there I mean because it is positive uh, but there's so little of this relative to the calcium and the base cations and all that that it's it we don't really account for it much on the exchange but just be aware that it is actually happening and then on that same note um, it is it is sometimes fixed. So when we talk about exchangeable versus fixed with any nutrient, which this is mostly a potassium discussion, but um, here here um, this is loosely held on a clay surface and it can bounce right off back into the solution very quickly. Now when we've got shrink swell and and wetting and drying and things like that, and there, and there are certain expandable two to one clay types, ammonium can be fixed. And um, th this can happen, it can get locked in there. Um, now this is less and less if you've got high potassium because they're, they're both can be fixed on those exchange sites. So that can be, this can be somewhat limited or dictated by the potassium levels. So they are related, but um, neither of these two are, are really major concerns that are happening a lot, but they are part of the cycles I'll show them. And then another potential loss here with, with an ammonium. Um, so when we talk about, so I, I've got here manure just going straight to the organic end pool, but in reality, there is another line here because there is some ammonium ion um, in this, in manure inputs. And so um, when, we're, when we're doing this and if we're not incorporating this, um, there is a process where we can lose some of the ammonium. It'll be converted or volatilized into ammonia gas and, and leave this. Um, so a lot of times to avoid this, this is really common with urea or sometimes with manure applications. So um, if you get this on a day or two before a rain, we can really, really limit this. That's why we, we talk about not allowing that. So there's management things we can do to, to limit this pathway of loss. And now, um, finally, sort of the most, probably the most important and the most prevalent is um, ammonium. 
um, does go through, again, a bacteria or microbial driven process of nitrification. So ammonium, it's sort of another, again, it's a two-step process. Um, sort of nitrite is formed first, and uh, there's a very quick reaction to go to nitrate. There's so little of this in the soil, um, which is a good thing because this is actually toxic to plant roots. So if this were to accumulate and build up, you'd have uh, incredible um, plant death. So it's a good thing that this is just an intermediate step that doesn't stay around very long. Um, but but when we're talking about this, so the, the first step here, uh, nitrosomonas bacteria, um, this is an acidifying activity. This is an acidifying event. So this process, um, we are releasing protons or hydrogens into the system. So um, just be aware of that, that whenever we're adding ammonium fertilizer, that, that we are acidifying the soil. And it's it's actually this process that's happening um, that, that releases those protons and acidifies. Um, so another thing to kind of think about here. So when we add nitrification inhibitors, uh, when we've got that process to try to stop that. And the reason we want to stop that is because this loss pathway is not very common and we can easily manage this one with very little loss pathway here, but there's really not a whole lot we can do management other than using nitrification inhibitors to stop this from converting to nitrate. And the reason we don't want it to do that um, quickly is because this negative um, ion has a lot more potential loss pathways than this positive. So clay, negatively charged, it wants to hold on to, to these uh, guys. So we lose less ammonium. If we can keep it in this form longer, um, which is what most of those products do. So like I said, naturally, natively, if we don't do anything, um, this will stick in this form for a week or two, but we've got inhibitors we can apply and it can do this for six, eight, maybe even 10 weeks. You know, we can, we can extend this um, process in this form out a little bit longer. But once it gets into the nitrate form, um, there are, obviously, we would hope that the only pathway is plant uptake, um, but we know that's not true. Um, nitrate has uh, more, more fates once it gets there. And the first one being, uh, it, it is also immobilized. So microbes will also utilize this to, again, oftentimes out-competing a plant to uptake it. So uh, uh, the, plant, the, the microbes eat first. So if there's ammonium and nitrate available, they're going to get what they need and the plants are basically left for what's le left over. Um, so we've got a mobilization happening. We've, we've hopefully got some plant uptake happening, um, but then there's also leaching. So there's a pretty, uh, you know, devastating loss of nitrate and we can, a lot of regulations and a lot of, a lot of issues with this one, water quality issues. So this is one that we need to manage and, and really be uh, worried about. So it's another reason we kind of want to limit our, our, our nitrate um, in, in certain conditions. Um, so not only in, so if, so if you're in sandy conditions, sandy conditions, um, this tends to be very prominent because the water is going to move out. We're going to, we're going to lose it quite a bit, but as your soil type gets a little heavier, a little more clay in it, um, and tends to maybe get a little bit more waterlogged or go anaerobic, um, this denitrification process happens. So nitrification process happens, you know, it peaks out at, you know, 50 to 60% water filled pore space. Um, so you've got good aeration, you've got oxygen, you've got, um, you've got water, kind of all of that stuff. But as you reach saturation and you start to get more and more wet, and there's less oxygen, this, this kind of goes anaerobic and this process starts to go in another direction. So nitrate um, actually goes through a couple different intermediate steps and ends up, you know, producing nitrous oxide gas. So this is a greenhouse gas. This is radiatively active. So when it goes in the atmosphere, it does have warming potential. Um, this is a gas that it has a, a warming potential of about 300 times more uh, than carbon dioxide. So um, carbon dioxide always gets the talk, but this is also a very, very important greenhouse gas. But another note, when the denitrification process goes all the way through the process, it actually does convert um, back into atmospheric dinitrogen gas. So a complete denitrification process is inert. It, it has no global warming potential. It just ends up back here in this, this giant pool in the sky. Um, but, but most of the time, that's not the case. There is quite a bit that, that leaves off in this N2O form, but we're also producing N2 gas. 
Uh, so that's it. Um, I try to keep that quick. I guess we hit about 20 minutes. So I uh, appreciate taking the time. And so um, next week or so, I'll, I'll release another one of these. We'll talk about the phosphorus cycle. Um, it's not quite as uh, in-depth, so it'll probably be a little bit shorter of a video. Uh, but I appreciate it. Everybody have a good day.